So, our class, Finding Spiritual Balance in Your Life. Paramahansaji's teachings are a timeless treasure for anyone who wants to be able to center their life in God. And I know that many of you have committed and made a priority to having your meditations, practicing the presence, studying the teachings. And yet, there's also times when circumstances make that very difficult. And I know that many also have young children, uh, elderly parents, those with special needs, that their circumstances might be such that they cannot have a balanced schedule that they would like to have. But know that God's aware of this. He sees the effort we are making with our hearts. And regardless of what our outer circumstances are, we can always practice the presence. Keep the consciousness with God. And that gives us inner spiritual balance, regardless of our outer activities. I was talking with a a mother recently, and she has a baby and a highly active toddler. And so she is kept busy all day long. And, And she was telling me, I really miss my longer meditations. In fact, I miss being able to meditate very much at all. And she said, but I talk to God constantly throughout the day. I'm always talking to Master. And I said, well, then you're doing what you can. You know, and, and God is having you learn certain lessons that are meant for you right now in the situation you're in. So it's not about what we think it should be. It's about just giving our hearts our time inside to God. And sometimes our life can just feel, well, it's, it's a little much, but I'm okay. Or, gee, I wish I had a little bit more time to be, you know, relaxed. And, and yet, you know, that's just the way things are. Well, you know, in 1991, there was a study done, and they found that Americans were working one month longer a year than they had been in 1970. Americans were actually working more on the job than medieval serfs. Now this is kind of an interesting thing. And yet uh, since then, of course, a lot has happened in the world since then, and especially in recent years. You know, a lot of challenges that have changed things. But when you look at the underlying causes behind that before, what they were doing before, the wanting more, wanting bigger, so then you've got to make more money. You know, houses used to be pretty small, and then they got bigger and bigger. And so all these things, of course, require uh, maintaining them and replacing them. And so that consciousness kind of came forward with us, this idea of more, it became the norm. And so you have to ask yourself, is this giving me greater happiness or greater stress? The wonderful thing is that we are always free to choose. Always free to choose what we're going to do, how much we're going to do. Delusion is very good at its job. I'm sure you've all noticed this. Because it not only makes the illusion feel real, but it also can disguise it so it looks like this is important. This is being responsible. Maybe even being spiritual. You've got to care. And yet, we have to step back and look at that. Take the time to reflect on it. Because otherwise, delusion can fool us. Now, we have spiritual balance when we also have physical and mental balance. Guruji said to develop ourselves physically, mentally, spiritually. 
And he explains in the teachings how we can do that. So we'll just look at a few of those points. And when you think of physically, being physically balanced, the thing about Master's teachings is that it's about moderation, nothing extreme in either direction, towards the physical or the spiritual. Moderation. So eating properly, not overeating, not undereating. Eating properly in the sense of not being fixated. I have to have 10 leaves of, of lettuce in my salad. So I knew someone who felt that way. <laughs> Or it's feeling that I can never, ever have dessert. Gucci ate dessert. You know, not every day. But, you know, that idea of, of uh, being balanced about it. Also getting some exercise. Recreation. And we can feel, well, that sounds really good, but where does the time come from to be able to do that? And we'll get to that in just a little bit. You know, when, when I was growing up, I was very physically active, and I was really into sports and and running and and all. And then, after a few years after I graduated from school, I had gone to visit a friend of mine, and she lived on this little hill in a cabin about part way up the hill. And she wanted to show me the view at the top of the hill. And so we we started up, and she just sort of shot up the hill. And I couldn't keep up with her. And now this was a hill, not even a big hill, and it certainly wasn't a mountain. And, and I was huffing and puffing, and I realized I'm really out of shape, even though you wouldn't have known. It wasn't like I was overweight or anything. I looked good. But, you know, I wasn't keeping up with physical activity. I wasn't doing those things that allowed my body to be exercised. And so, um, you know, when you look at taking the time for physical health, it makes us feel good. It gives us more energy. And it ties in with how we feel mentally, which ties in with how we feel spiritually. Now, having it, the uh, SRF lessons, there's the energization exercises. And those of you that have the, the lessons, of course, know there are so many benefits to the exercises and how they promote overall health for our bodies. Now, you look at mentally. We know positive thinking is important. And we don't want to get caught up in worries and stresses, fixating on things and making them bigger in our minds. And yet, it can happen, you know, without us even sometimes really noticing. But Guruji said, don't make a fuss about anything. There it is, pretty plain and simple. Don't make a fuss about anything. Whenever you worry, remember, you are deepening the cosmic delusion within you. And that's exactly what the cosmic delusion wants. Whenever you worry, remember, you are deepening the cosmic delusion within you. In the autobiography of a yogi, Paramahansa Ji speaks of his guru, Sri Yuteswar Ji, and shares a story about how he would go and visit him every day and he'd take the train and then at the end of the day he'd tra take the train back home. And he said that when it was getting time for him to, to leave, to take the train, he would start to become mentally restless and kind of agitated because he was waiting for Sri Uteshwar to release him so that he could leave. And Sri Uteshwar often didn't. And in this, he said, you know, this went on for a while, and, and Guruji felt it was a little unreasonable of Sri Uteshwar. But Sri Uteshwar finally one time said, I am not grudging your preparing timely to go to the train, but I say there is no need for you to be restless. 
Why allow nervous excitement to ruffle the mind? You should be naturally calm when you are with me. Think about that with the guru. And when the train time comes, calmly get ready to go. Now, Sri Yateshwar made Paramahansaji miss the train several times. And Guruji said it was marvelous training. It was wonderful because he finally learned how to be calmly active as well as actively calm. So we should be calm when we are with the guru. The guru is always with us. Do what we need to do without mental agitation. Because mental agitation uses up a lot of energy. Spiritually. Diamanta said, if you meditate and then try during activity to keep the mind centered in the divine, you automatically begin to express balance in your life. And you become a calmer human being, operating not from emotion, but from a deeper state of inner quietude. Throughout Guruji's teachings, it always comes back to meditation. Because meditation grounds us in what we really are the soul, it breaks up that delusion that has a hold of us otherwise. So keeping our minds centered in the divine. So first meditation, that's the foundation upon which spiritually balanced life exists. The more we meditate, the more we deepen that relationship. And that relationship becomes increasingly more important to us. And delusion has less and less of a hold. Studying the teachings puts us in the vibratory presence of the guru. The teachings are alive. But when you feel that you feel a little out of tune, or you feel you're just so restless you're not able to really meditate, read from Master's writings. It brings you into that presence. And the more we attune ourselves to God and Guru, the stronger becomes that conviction to choose things that are natural to our souls. Because the soul is perfectly balanced. The more we focus on aligning ourselves with what we are, the more it automatically manifests. Sometimes it's as simple as life can feel so full and so busy that we don't have time to stop and reflect. Stop and think. Really think. What do I really want in life? Are the things I'm doing taking me where I want to go? Is there the satisfaction of feeling that what I want inside is aligned with what I'm doing outwardly? People pursue fulfillment and happiness in a variety of ways most people unsuccessfully because of where they're focused. But eventually, every soul arrives at the point where it realizes it needs God in their life because we are the soul. Regardless of what we're doing outwardly, we need that presence. We need that bond. we begin to understand that we are not physical beings. It's really a very strong delusion, but it is a delusion. We've been here many, many times in many different bodies, many different roles. And the reason we're here right now is because we don't want to keep coming back. 
We want to be done. And that's exactly why we have the Guru's teachings. Guruji said, to speak of seeking God and material fulfillment together sounds good. But unless you meditate deeply and regularly so that you anchor your consciousness in God first, the world will claim you and you will have no time for him. And of course, that's delusion's uh, goal is to keep us coming back. The world will claim you. The world says you need this, you need that to be happy. Otherwise, you'll be unhappy. And because delusion is so good at disguising things to look like we need them or else we'll feel deprived, we'll feel miserable, it has the ability to turn wants into needs. They're not real needs. True necessities are actually quite small. But mentally, we can develop what we feel are a lot of needs. And those, of course, mean that we expend energy, time, and effort into chasing an illusion. When we cut back the excess, we can feel like we might be missing out. We don't have what other people have. We're not doing what others do. But what are we giving up to live a life that gives us balance, gives us happiness, and above all, centers us in God? the source of all peace, all love, all joy, all wisdom. I remember years ago, there was a movie that came out about a top fashion company. And the woman who ran this company was probably the boss out of your nightmares. <laughs> she really driven and really worked her people really hard and and very demanding, expected them to jump when she said jump. And, and this young woman ended up working for her and felt she had really gotten a wonderful job, you know, as her personal secretary. Now she had a Blackberry and she'd wear these fancy gowns to these elaborate uh, functions with her boss and stuff. It was all very glamorous. But as time went on, and the boss would call her in the middle of the night and said, bring me this. And, and you know, she was on 24 hours a day on call for this, this boss. And she realized that all of the outer things that looked so glorious were actually just things that left her feeling empty. And she had no life. And so one day, she finally arrived at that point. No, it doesn't matter to go to Paris and do all these things that a lot of people would like to do. She was walking across the street, and her Blackberry again rang, which usually rang very frequently. And she could hear, you know, the boss, you know, where are you? And, you know, I need you and all this. And as she got across the street, and there was a garbage can, <laughs> she threw the Blackberry away. And she decided to live her life. Guruji said, when you see the masses who have no real happiness or success, don't think that life is meant to be that way. You can make of yourself whatever you want to be. Remember that. We are not bound by anything except ourselves and how we limit our own thinking. He goes on to say, it is what you have attained within that determines your success. If you have nothing within, you have no happiness. And if you have nothing outside, but are happy within, you have all success. So there it is. When we are identified with what we do, 
and we can think that what we do is what we are, it creates desires. Isn't it interesting when you first meet someone, one of the very first things we ask is, oh, what do you do? And somehow that's how then you think of this person. And that just happens to be their momentary outer role. It's not their soul, not who they are. But those desires that we can create by identifying with what we do turns into uh, wanting recognition, wanting praise. Uh, We care about how people think of us. Uh, We become stressed, worried. We burden ourselves in so many ways because all those things we don't have control over what someone thinks of us how things will go well, then I'll be happy. And if they don't go the way I think they should, I'll be unhappy. And somehow, when we feel we want to improve, we end up doing more of the same. It's just like, okay, I've got to work harder at this same thing. I've got to put more energy and time into it. Now, there are certain things that can be that way learning our job better, or listening to other people better. But sometimes we're not identifying whether that's really it unless we step back, think about it. Because no matter how much we do, if we are focused on external gain in whatever way that looks like, even if the world felt we were the greatest, we wouldn't be satisfied. We still wouldn't be satisfied because all of that is of the world and we are not of the world. Focusing on false goals, false success, means that we're not living the life meant for us. We're living the life imposed on us. And that's not necessary. Shouldn't be. Before I got on the path, some friends of mine bought land way out in a remote area in Oregon and they would come up for a few weeks in the summertime and I moved up there on their land, built a little one-room cabin. And of course, there's no electricity, no running water, nothing there, except lots of land and wildlife. And, and, and you know, I grew my own vegetables. I chopped wood for having uh, warmth and, and I analyzed things by how much daylight I had left to be able to do something. And it was amazing. It was amazing as far as what the needs were. And I realized that until I came in the ashram, it was one of the richest experiences I had because it wasn't based on any of the superficial things that can block out God. The beauty there, the quiet, the serenity, everything, you could just slow down enjoy the stars. I mean, it was out in the middle of nowhere. There was no light pollution, no meteorite showers. Everything made you feel close to God. And so we have to look at what is it that allows me to feel God's presence, that allows me to, to know that I am with him. Simple life. It doesn't mean we should give up everything and move to the woods. That wouldn't be very practical. Sometimes just a few adjustments in life can make a big difference. And for every single one of us, our lives are unique. So we have to look for ourselves. What does that look like? Taking a walk in nature, very soothing, very soothing. It can calm the mind, calm the heart. It makes us more aware 
and present in the present moment. You know, some inner schools that don't have, uh, the children that go to them don't have any uh, exposure to nature. And they started taking the children out in, in nature for classes. And, and they found uh, it really changed things. The children were more concentrated. They got better grades. They were more peaceful. Very few fights. Just from being out in nature, making that connection, they were relaxed. It's very healing. Guruji said, My heaven is within me. My inner heaven makes everything even more heavenly. Without that inner contentment, even a paradise on earth can become a Hades. I see that if it were not for my inner joy, the problems of the heavy responsibility I have undertaken here could make me so unhappy I would like to run away. We can all be grateful he didn't do that. He said, your idea that you have to have certain things in order to be happy is a delusion. Even after you get them, you are still unhappy. Live simply. Don't have so many things to take care of. Now, remember, he said this way back. We have a whole lot more things nowadays than we did during Guruji's lifetime. Control your life. Make it as simple as you can. Why? Because then we have time for what's really important to our soul time to seek God, to feel the happiness that comes from having that connection with him. Guruji continued to say, I know that I am with God and nothing can touch me. How will you feel if we have that kind of conviction, that kind of knowing, not just an intellectual thought, but knowing that? I know that I am with God and nothing can touch me. That realization has given me supreme happiness. My inner happiness is my greatest possession. It is wealth beyond the dream of kings. The teachings and the meditation techniques that Guruji has given us shows us how we can commune with God how to live in this world, and how to reclaim our status as children of God. We all already are children of God, but God is waiting for us to claim it, to realize it. And when we do, that changes our relationship with the world. We live in joy within And we start to choose more selectively, more wisely, the direction, the activities, and the pace of our life. We're not compelled to conform to the dictates of outer circumstances. We look for solutions that align with our true self inside. So we choose based on being anchored in peace inside. That definitely leads to a balanced life. About a year ago, I spoke with a woman, it was during the intense part of the pandemic, and she was sharing with me that before the pandemic hit, she She worked full-time. She was very active. She basically went from one activity to another and her social commitments and everything. And and she felt that she really liked her life and and that it was what she planned to continue doing. And then, of course, just like with everyone else, when the pandemic hit, it had quite an impact on her. It disrupted everything. Everything came to a halt. And she was surprised to find that she felt very empty inside. And she started to look at it because she 
had thought her life was pretty rich. And so she started to analyze oh, that some of the things she was doing, and then she reached a point of thinking many of the things she was doing were not based on choices she consciously made, but just habit. So it was just sort of the pattern that her life had become. It wasn't bad, but now that she had more time, she thought, what would Guruji want me to do? And she started to meditate more. She started to spend more time deeply studying the teachings, not just kind of skimming through and reading a few pages, but she would read something and then really reflect on, what does that mean in my life? How can I apply that to me and my situation? She started going for walks, and then she started going for hikes. She started to feel more energy. She felt really good physically. And she started thinking, what am I seeking? What is it I really want? And she knew all along she wanted God. But then when she looked at her life pre-pandemic, she saw that a lot of those activities didn't contribute to it. She knew, of course, that it didn't mean she should sit and meditate all day long and study the teachings and not do anything. But she said her life had been like eating empty calories. It It wasn't doing anything for her. And it was actually preventing her from being able to fulfill her true goals. This was quite an insightful place to arrive at. And so she decided after the pandemic was over, she was not going back into her, her old patterns of how she lived. And she felt happier, more peaceful. She didn't feel the need like she had before to race around and feel, I need to do more. She said she realized she felt guilty if she wasn't filling every minute with something. The world can sometimes make us have that kind of feeling if we let it. But she said, now I decide. I decide. And... She says she could do her work. She had time to go out in nature. But above all, she had time for her spiritual practices. And she said, now my life is truly rich, richer than it has ever been. Paramahansa Ji said, by a balanced life, I mean one that is calmly active and actively calm. To be a prince of peace, sitting on the throne of poise, directing the kingdom of activity, is to be spiritually healthy. Too much activity makes one an automaton, and too much calmness makes one lazy and unpractical. Peace is the enjoyment of life. Activity is the expression of life. Without a balance, there will be no end to your troubles. Balance means lasting peace. You know, our Diamata, who was president for more than 55 years of SRF, she had also, of course, our India branch, Yagoda Satsanga Society. She carried tremendous responsibilities. And yet, She was so balanced. She always had energy and enthusiasm. For one thing, she didn't identify emotionally what what she was doing and what the outcome would be. She was anchored in the thought of, I want to please you, Lord. Let your will be done. And she didn't carry the work with her into her meditations. When it was time for God, she left the rest aside. And she didn't miss her annual retreats. She went on her retreats. And I remember one time I was on retreat in the desert and and she came out there and she was staying on the main compound and I was on in one of the houses that was 
a little bit off to the side. And one day I stepped outside of the house I was staying in, and she didn't see me. She was walking around the path of the compound. And the, what I saw was that she was so relaxed. It was like her body was just so fluid, so flowing. And she was enjoying the beauty of nature and really taking it all in. She was so present in the moment. And no doubt, with God. And I thought, this is the way to be. This is what I want to strive towards. Balance enables us to experience a deep, rich inner life. So does this require self-discipline? Yes. But we do it because we care about ourselves, our real self. And we also care about the others who have to be around us. The more balanced we are, the more peaceful we are, the more accepting, the more understanding, the more patient. Because to be really balanced means we are centered inside. We're centered in our soul nature. Guruji said, not until you feel in your consciousness the absolute importance of God will you reach him. Do not permit life to cheat you. Delusion really wants to. Form form those good habits that make for true happiness. Follow a simple diet. Exercise the body and meditate daily, no matter what happens. Pray to him every day, Lord, even if I die, or if the whole world crumbles away, I am going to find time daily to be with you. Now that might sound strong, but we have to have that kind of conviction We have to be convinced within ourselves that we cannot live without God because delusion is strong. It will pull at us. But the stronger we become in what we know what we want, the weaker delusion becomes. When we have that, that resolve, then it's much easier not to waver. We have to consciously do it. You know, we no longer live in a world where the entire day is spent just trying to survive for food and shelter. And all the modern conveniences were, of course, meant to give us more free time. And yet, there are so many, many ways to spend our time. So many ways to waste our time on things that Just become habits. And yet they can make us restless, anxious, just unsatisfied. Because we know, our soul knows, this isn't what's going to make me happy. Years ago, I went to Victoria, Canada with my father. And after we checked into the hotel... We went across the street to this little outdoor restaurant to have something to eat. And it took a while before we got seated. There, there weren't other people waiting for tables, but it just took a while. And then it was a while longer before they brought us the menus. But, you know, that was fine. It was very, it was very peaceful, uh, pleasant environment. And, and then, you know, we, when we got our meal, we, we just really enjoyed being nice and relaxed and all. And then when they cleared the plates, uh, they didn't bring the check. And, you know, in the back of my mind, there's this almost this anxiousness, like you're expecting the check because they want the table so they can have someone else sit down. And, you know, and, and I was observing myself do that. And then I looked around at the other tables and they didn't have their checks either. And I realized that they didn't bring you the check until you asked for it. 
because they wanted you to have the full experience of enjoying yourselves, you know, of really just relaxing, being with the one you were with or even by yourself. And that was why that atmosphere was so pleasant, so peaceful. And then uh, after, in the evening, we were staying right on near the, the waterfront and there would be these street performers. And there was this one juggler, he said he'd been doing juggling for about 20 years there, and he was throwing these flaming sticks in the air. He had about four or five of them. And he was talking and just, you know, he was very relaxed. And then he said, all right, now let's speed it up for the Americans. <laughs> and we all laughed. I glanced around and thought, yeah, it looks like we're all American tourists here. But the whole trip, I noticed that they were at a different pace. It was very nice. It was very soothing. And it made it so that you could think clearly because thoughts weren't crowding in upon you and things weren't crowding in upon you. So it was very, it was, it was quite an eye-opener as far as uh, how we live. Uh, based on the environment that we're in and how we can create our own environment. That's up to us. So you look at who's happy and why. It's not about the outer things. Many people are not living the life they want and they don't know. They don't know what it is that isn't working, which is why they think, well, more. More will give me what it is. But when we look at the underlying reasons of why do I do what I do? You know, everyone needs to support themselves, take care of their family. But how to accomplish that is limited only by the way we limit it in our minds. Everybody else does this, so I guess this is how I have to do it. No. It's very individual. Custom made. It's as the possibilities are as broad as we think they are. So yes, we need to fulfill our responsibilities. But let me look at what's the best way for me to do that. And what are my true responsibilities? I could go on with a lot more, but I see we're almost at the time where we need to start our exercise. So just one quick story about a man. There's a man that I spoke with several times uh, years ago who he and his wife both have very intense uh, jobs that require long hours. Uh, His wife is a computer uh, consultant and travels all over the United States to advise big companies. And and I remember when I met with her and, and I could tell she was unhappy. And then I learned that she had wanted to be a teacher But her family felt like, that's not being very successful. You should do something else. And so she ended up with this high-power career. And because they both worked in stressful jobs and long hours, they had a cook, a gardener, a housekeeper, a shopper, and then someone who coordinated all the others. And so one of their salaries went for all of this that they were maintaining. And I remember telling the the husband once, you know, if you you let all those people go, you could both really cut back on your hours Mm -hmm. and enjoy life more because one of them really liked to cook and the other one really liked to garden. Of course, that was out of the question. And, or one of you could completely stop working. But, That idea of what success is, what it looks like, can be very strong and hard to let go of. 
If we were made of this world, the things of the world would please us. They would give us ultimate satisfaction. But we are made of God. So nothing in this world will ever do it for us. And when we really arrive at that point, deep within ourselves, we won't be tripped up by the things of the world. We can see it and we choose. We choose for ourselves what our soul wants. And that feels very, very freeing. We want to do that more and more. You are the master of the moments of your life. Guruji said that. Think about it. You are the master of the moments of your life. That's very powerful. How we spend our time, what we make of our life, it's important to remember. The moments are precious because they determine how we spend the years through the law of cause and effect and habits. It's not, oh, I'll just do this, it's okay. No, because then we're probably going to do it again and again and again. And then we start identifying with it. So we don't want to wait. We want to do it now, right now. So now we're going to do a little exercise. I think you've all been given a couple of pieces of paper. No? Oh, well, some of you, at least I see, have been taking notes, so you can use that paper. And I will show you. It's, It's actually very simple. Whatever size paper you have to make three columns... So like you're making two horizontal lines down the center. And so in the top of the first column, you want to write most important. Then at the top of the second column, secondary. And at the top of the third column, fillers. You might be getting an idea where this is going. Okay. Now, we're going to take a minute, just a minute. Um, You could do this more on your own later on. Write in that first column, what are the most important things to you in your life? So we'll just take one minute to do that. Now, for the sake of time, we're going to go to the next column. But like I said, this is really a good exercise to reflect on. Uh, You can certainly do it again later. In the second column, write down the things that are secondary in your life. The next most important things.
All right, now in the third column, write down the other things that are in your life that are just fillers. Not really important, but fillers. All right, now, either take another piece of paper or the back of that one, depending on what you have, and make three more columns. Again, you know, two lines down the page and right at the top, most important, above the first column, secondary, above the second column, and fillers above the third. Now, above the, uh, below, uh, and under the first column, most important, write down what the world says is most important. Now write down what the world says is secondarily most important. And lastly, write down what the world says are the fillers. Now, the interesting thing is, when I did this with a group of teens, uh, they were amazed to see the difference between the two uh, sheets of paper. And, and they, we had quite a discussion about it. And I'd like to share with you a few of, of their results. For the teens themselves, they felt most important was God, family, developing themselves so they're happy being honest, 
helping others. Secondary for them, health, good grades, supporting friends, pets. A few of them had pets in the first column, too. (laughs) Helping at home, relaxing. And under the third column, fillers for the teens were social media, movies, music, hanging out and just talking, cleaning their room. (laughs) That was a filler to them. But then they said, what the world said was most important, making money, having a successful career, possessions, getting ahead of others, power, fame, being aware of what others think of you, social media. And the interesting thing was most of them could not think of secondary things, but they had a lot of fillers, what the world thought was uh, the least important. God, health, self-improvement, developing personal interests, balance, meeting your own goals. And so I thought it was fascinating because they saw it in kind of a black and white way. The world was saying, these are the things that are important, and those things aren't. And there wasn't kind of any middle ground for them. But you can see from your own lists, and because we are going to be running out of time, we can't get into it more, but you can see where the differences are. And that's why we want to be the ones to choose because we are bumping up uh, a world, an environment that lots of times tells us other things are more important than what we feel inside. We're never at the mercy of it. We shouldn't feel we are. We just need to be aware. Be aware. So that's why we choose. Guruji said, God knows what you need. Now, who else can say that? Not even the people closest to us can say that. We don't even know what we need. We know what we want, but we don't know what we need. Only God and Guru know what we need, and they are always wanting to give us that. No matter what that looks like, it can be an outer struggle, a test. It can feel like, my gosh, What are you doing to me? And if he could say something, he'd say, I'm taking you to God. Because that's exactly what he's got his his whole focus on, is to take us to God. They are always actively present in our lives. Guruji never takes a vacation and just checks in with us. He's there. And we know that. And so, through meditation through practicing the presence, studying and and striving to apply the teachings the best we can, we deepen our personal relationship with God and Guru. And the more we deepen it, the more we trust them. The more we trust them, the more we turn ourselves over to them. That's what we want to do. They know what we need. We just want to hold on to them tighter and tighter. And let them fill us with their love, their joy, their wisdom, their light.